Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, weekly series where we get to speak to guests now from all around the world. I'm coming to you live from uh, Los Angeles. I'm uh, Rabbi Erez Sherman from Sinai Temple. I know we have guests uh, also from all around the world watching, um, West Coast, East Coast, uh, and I know also from the land of Israel as well. We are honored this uh, morning to learn from a friend, but also a family member, um, Ari Thatcher, um, former uh, senior engineer from the Iron Dome, as we know the very famous well-known invention that protected and continues to protect uh, the citizens of the land of Israel from uh, rocket fire. Um, and today we're going to go in depth on three different areas, um, social, religious, and militarily of what is the situation on the ground in the land or on, in the land of Israel, uh, what that looks uh, perhaps a little different than here as well um, in, in the United States and how the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, is continuing um, even throughout this uh, unprecedented, uncertain time. Um, before we begin with Ari's presentation, first of all, I want to thank him for joining us uh, late at night in the land of Israel, but also um, this is brought to you on behalf of the Sinai Temple Israel Center, um, strengthening our U.S.-Israel relationship and all we do here at Sinai Temple. Ari has been a guest physically here at Sinai Temple, and we look forward to welcoming him again into the walls of our building. Um, in order to do this uh, so we can interact with each other, um, Ari will present and then if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can chat um, with your questions and Rebecca Small, our Sinai Temple Program Director, will feed the questions to us and you'll have a chance to ask Ari those questions for you as well. Again, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can chat into those questions and we will answer them as best as possible. So with, uh, if also for all of our programming and services, please visit SinaiTemple.org. Um, you can also go to our YouTube station, youtube.com YouTube slash Sinai Temple Presents. We are fully functional, even with the doors closed. This morning's program or afternoon or evening program, wherever you are, is called Lockdown But Not Shutdown. And without further ado, we want to welcome my good friend and cousin by marriage, uh, Ari Satcher. Good morning or good evening, Ari. Good morning, Rabbi Sherman. Um, if I may um, try to go to the slideshow. See how it works. Share the screen. We good? All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Um, try to think long and hard what I could say that would try to um, try to encapsulate what's been going on here for the last uh, couple of couple of weeks. Uh, last couple of weeks have taken a couple of years, and what I'm trying to do is trying to get. Um, Trying to get my head around what was, what's been going on, and, and the first thing I want to talk about is is defending the country. Um, Israel likes to say that business as usual, everything's working fine. Business is not as usual. Business will not be as usual for a good long time. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of money that's been funneled into combating coronavirus, and defense uh, budgets are being strained. Programs that we thought were going to happen are not going to happen. International sales are going to be severely curtailed and we're gonna to have to figure out how to live with this. The question was, what do we as defense contractors do um, during coronavirus? And the answer is, well, we can sit back and, uh, and, and try to make the best of what we have, or we can say whether we protect Israel by shooting down missiles, or we protect Israel by shooting down viruses, we're still protecting Israel and that's what we chose to do. And it all started in the army when you have one of the most prestigious units, unit um, 81 from the, um, from the intelligence unit. And these guys, instead of trying to find out what the Iranians are doing, and as far as I know, we still know what the Iranians are doing, but they did find time to solve the biggest problem. And the biggest problem was getting enough ventilators. The whole idea of bending the curve, the whole idea of keeping the amount of, of, um, of sick people down was to prevent the health system from breaking. In order to prevent that from happening, we had to strengthen the system to make sure that at all times there were enough ventilators. How do we get hospital grade ventilators in? And so instead of uh, solving problems that had to do with Iran and the like, the folks in um, Unit 81 found a way to turn home breathing devices, which you can get on AliExpress, um, and they turned those into hospital grade ventilators. Well, not to be left behind, 
You look at Israel's largest defense contractors. There's um, Israel Aircraft Industries, which is the largest. There's Rafael, where I work, which is the second largest. And Elbit, we call ourselves the Triumvirate. Although as far as um, we at Rafael are concerned, the other two organizations are possessed by the forces of Satan, but that's, that's neither here nor there. You look at what, this is an article that's taken out of the, um, the news that Israel aircraft industries, along with the Israeli Ministry of Defense, have worked with another company in order to produce a new kind of ventilator, to add to the ventilators to make sure that the medical system can handle the number of sick people from COVID. Ditto for Elbit. Elbit is also working, has worked to set up thousands of ventilators to keep, to keep the hospitals um, available, stop them from, uh, from breaking down. Well, it turns out that in combating COVID-19, you don't necessarily have to build ventilators in order to combat it. And we at Rafael, and I'm certain everybody else in IAI and Elbit, we're encouraged to use what you know and see if what you know can somehow help combat the disease, not necessarily in combating it directly, but combating it indirectly as well. And we at Rafael had a number of innovations that came online over about a month from the beginning of March that helped change the way Israel addresses COVID. We have on the left, you have your corona robot. Last thing a doctor wants to do is to have to enter the room of a patient who has a severely uh, communicable disease. What we did was we took essentially a missile, took out the bomb inside of it so it doesn't go boom accidentally. We put wheels on it and you have the same kind of sensors in it, the same kind of eyeball that sees the person, the same kind of mobility, which we essentially change from flight into, um, in, into a, a wheeled vehicle. And now this goes from room to room. It addresses the patients, it deals with the patients, it takes the patient's vitals without having to have a doctor go into the room. The same kind of technology. Over here on the right, Rafael's missiles are, 90% of our missiles are based on what we call electro-optical seekers. We see the bad guy and because we see him, we can zoom in on him and boom, take him out. Well, the same kind of thermal imaging, infrared, can be used to take the temperature of people that are coming into large crowds. So we took military grade thermometers, we changed the interface, we allowed them to look at different temperatures because they were looking at temperatures of buildings, they were looking at temperatures of missiles that they had to take out. And now all of a sudden, they're looking at temperatures of people that are standing at a such and such a distance. Notice that every person in this picture has his temperature above his head. And this was all done by Raphael, all done in real time. And every time something went up, every time one, another one of these innovations was released, boom, we, were, we, we, we have our own personal communication and we all got this really feel good feeling that we're doing something that helps. Um, but it isn't only that, it's um, something called an open source ventilator. Yes, we have companies and these companies are for-profit companies and we're trying to do what it is that we do best to help the world. But here you have a number of companies that work together to release the source code of a ventilator. These guys had plans for a ventilator. They, this company called AmboVent, they wanted to build a ventilator. The problem was we had the plans, but we didn't have the facilities to build the ventilator. So what they did was they released the plans of the ventilator to the internet so that anybody who wanted to could take the plans and build his own ventilators. This was not a time to make money. This was not a time for any kind of economical, homo economicus thought. This is a time to save lives. And that's what people went ahead and did. They waived any kind of rights they had, put it up on the internet. I wanna show you an example. This, what you're seeing now in Israel is not necessarily what you are seeing in the United States of America. What I did was on Saturday night, I went to Google and I did a search over here on the left. I put in Raphael, my company, coronavirus. Over here, I put in Raytheon, company that I've worked a lot with over the last number of years, excellent company. I would never besmirch them and coronavirus. Looking on the left, you have Raphael is fighting coronavirus with powerful technologies. Israel defense industry switches gears. Taylor's AI big data to combat coronavirus. That was another thing we had called, um, well, another program we have with, 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 with deep learning that we took it to find out where coronavirus would be expected, where another outbreak would be expected, and we could proactively treat it. Missiles out, ventilators in. Raphael is combating coronavirus. What's Raytheon doing? Well, Raytheon's talking to its suppliers. Raytheon Technologies on UTC, seven Raytheon employees test positive for coronavirus. It's all good. 
and this is what they're doing, but they're not going out and actively trying to combat it. They did the same thing with Elbit and Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin, largest defense contract in the US. Again, I'm not trying to besmirch it, but in Israel, there is a tremendous value in life. And we were willing to sacrifice the economy for life. Elbit, coping with coronavirus. Um, Rambam Hospital using Elbit systems. Medical trials of Elbit, radar-aided corona detection. Lockheed Martin reacts to the spread of coronavirus, trimmed sales outlook. Of course, we trimmed sales outlook. The sales are not going to be the same. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the, the, the most important thing. It was important that he was getting out there, doing what we could to help protect the citizens of the state of Israel. U.S.-Israel cooperation, one of the things I live and breathe for, and I've been doing this for the last 10 years, is trying to assist, trying to, um, trying to, to um, assist as much as I can, U.S.-Israel cooperation. And U.S.-Israel cooperation has typically been based on defense. U.S. supporting Israeli defense, U.S. supporting Iron Dome, U.S. benefiting from Israeli defense technology, benefiting from Iron Dome, benefiting from David Sling, benefiting from trophy defensive tanks. And now, while Israeli defense industries are looking at a different kind of defense, so is the U.S.-Israel cooperation. And while um, it, about less than a month ago, I received a message from uh, Ted Cruz's office and Chris Kuhn's office, uh, offices that I have a very nice relationship with, that they are seeking to appropriate $12 million in legislation to support joint research, Israel and U.S. in detecting, creating, and curing coronavirus. Because when it comes to defense, what we are defending ourselves against right now is not rockets. Yes, it's rockets, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing to defend against is the coronavirus. And Israel and the U.S. need to work together. And the understanding of Congress that this needs to happen is, is nothing less than heartwarming. One of the things that we lost in Corona was community. In Israel, we were locked down shortly after Purim in the beginning of March. Things got very, very bad, uh, especially on Purim, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And the government reacted very, very with a quick succession of measures, which was nothing less than draconian, and essentially locked everybody inside their house. Now, now I live in what's called a yeshuv, small town, 350 families, and we were separated. And we've went from a family of 350 families to 350 families, and we needed community. We wanted a minion. We wanted a daven together. We wanted to feel together. Problem is, we're all living in our own houses. So here's a, a, a bird's eye view. It's actually a satellite view of Moreshe. How can we daven with a minion, given the geopolitics of being locked in our houses and the topography of our issue? So here's where I live. Here's the shul up here that was shut down. And the question was, in order for us to make a minion that we can all dive in together, one person who leads the prayers has to be able to see everybody. Turns out that the highest point in this area is my second floor where I hang up my laundry. And from this point, if you do um, a quick uh, line of sight analysis, I can see pretty much from here all the way over here. Using WhatsApp, we got everybody on board daily. We had a minion in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, between 15 and 20 people. Everybody got out, and this is what I could see from my porch. This was Erev Shabbos two weeks ago. These are the people that you can see. There's a whole group of people on the left side that cannot see the people on the right side of my house. There's another, say, eight or so people on the side that can't see the 12 people over here. But there are 20 people that are davening, and when we daven together on Pesach, and we said Hallel, and I'm standing up there yelling at the top of my lungs, Anna, Hashem, Hoshiana, God, save us. And everybody answers, I, I started crying because together we were separate, but we were together because we wanted and we needed to be together. We needed our sense of community. And, and because we needed it, we reached out and we grabbed it. Moving on, soul music. One of the biggest things um, that people did to, uh, to buy the time was to listen to the radio. And the radio knew that. And with the radio, um, all the different stations in Israel began to play a different kind of music. And I hadn't heard this music pretty much since summer 2006. And we were bombarded by the Hezbollah. And there was a 15-year hiatus. I hadn't heard that since 1991. And we were bombarded by the Iraqis. And once again, we went back to Israeli soul music. 
This time, Israeli musicians played at home, but they didn't pick any musicians. They picked musicians that played the kind of music that has a, a religious bent, a spiritual bent, a unabashed pro-Israel bent, people like Idan Reichel, people like Tipex, people like Yishai Rebo. And, and, and it turns out that if you look at the hit parade, this just appeared in, um, in uh, Shabbos's paper. If you look at the top 20 songs that appeared in Israel, every single one of them is either of a religious bent or it is of a good old Israel. Everything will pass today. Halavai, if only. Everything is a feel-good, touchy-feely Israeli song because we needed to get in touch with our inner selves. We weren't in the mood for, for, for music that didn't come from Israel. We needed our own music. We needed to, 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 to foster our own spirituality. We needed homegrown Israeli optimism. And two songs, uh, in my opinion, stuck out um, above other songs during these um, last uh, six weeks. Two of these, both of these songs have to do with Corona. And there were a number of songs that came out about coronavirus, COVID-19. This one's called Keter Melucha, The Crown of Majesty by Yishai Rebo. And the song is shouting out to God. Here's what happened to Israel. In a matter of four weeks, we went from a vibrant country to a country where you don't have weddings, to a country where people are sitting alone. And we knew that God is talking. We knew he's talking. He was shouting at us. He just hadn't the faintest idea what he's saying. And I hated it when people said, well, this justifies my view that such and such. It doesn't justify anything. I don't know what God's saying. I want to try to understand what God's saying. And what we understood was how will we know to unify ourselves in the separation? The, the, what I've been saying since the outset of my talk is that unity was paramount. And the Keter Melucha, we need together to crown God, not by ourselves. And that's, that feeling of a need for unity was only, only fortified by the next song. And the next song was a one and a half minute song called Ga'aguin Lifnei Adam, Longing for People by Hanan ben Ari. And if you look at the words, Hanan ben Ari is a popular, he's religious, he used to sing at weddings. He only started singing popular music very, very recently. We'd already thought we'd won it all. We're, we've got everything. And then all of a sudden, boom, you came and you infected us and you confounded us. And who are you? Well, you have brought back something that we hadn't had. People were in love with their phones. People were in love with travel. People had forgotten what it is to live with other people. And when God took the other people away from us, all of a sudden we had a longing for people. And the song goes through these, these haunting lyrics and the, the pictures in the background on YouTube are all of empty Israel. And soon this will all end, says Hanan ben Ari. And I just have one request that on the morning after, everything goes back to normal. And we don't know what kind of normal it's going to be. Just please don't let us go back to being exactly the way we are. Please let us learn something from this. And if learning has to do with being together, with understanding what it is to live with other people, then maybe it was worth it. I want to talk about being Israeli, not being American, but what makes Israelis Israeli. What's our, what's our special sauce? If you look at this graph over here, this graph essentially plots the um, number of people that came down with coronavirus per day um, as a function of the Jewish calendar. If you look on the left, the beginning of March, we had Purim. We already knew that there was a problem. We had already begun quarantining people that were coming back from Europe, but people were so blasé about quarantine. They really didn't care. They really weren't that, they really weren't that um, um, machmir, as we would say in Hebrew, um, punctilious about, um, about um, doing what it was they needed to do. On Purim, everybody went to parties. And in Purim, we had two or three different people. People are being named the new people that got coronavirus. Two weeks after Purim, because of our lax observance of the rules, we were up to 800 people a day coming down with the disease. And as soon as that happened, the government slammed down. They said, "You have, we have to hit the brakes. We're locking you down. They locked us down for two of the most important holidays in the entire calendar. They locked us down for Erev Pesach, my mother-in-law, who was living by herself, she spent Pesach, the Seder, by herself. She had to. She's an at-risk. She's above 70. She had to be by herself. 
and my wife and her siblings are killing themselves. But everybody was locked down in Pesach, and on the last day, the day after Pesach, is Mimuna, when the people of North African descent come out and they and they they on the streets and they they meet everybody and they give them food and everybody was locked down because the government knew if you open the door only slightly, then then we're going to open it forever. And that couldn't happen. We couldn't see another spike after Pesach like we've seen after Purim. And you can see the results after the Pesach shutdown that all of a sudden we went back to numbers that we were living with before. Over here, the holiday that I didn't plot was Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Yom Ha'atzma'ut was the worst Yom Ha'atzma'ut in history. Israel Independence Day, Israel um, Memorial Day were spent alone because the government knew that if they opened it even a millimeter, then we would start changing rule. Why is there no right turn on red in Israel? Because Israelis would say that if you can turn right on red, then you can also go straight on red and you can turn left also. In Israel, it's either all or everything. And the government shut down everything. And now Israel has been leading, pretty much leading the world along with a number of other countries, Australia and New Zealand in particular, we seem to have overcome the disease. We needed a draconian um, response. The question is why? In South Korea, they had an easy time. South Koreans went out and they told their citizens to start wearing masks, start social distancing, stop going to parties, and they did it. Well, why can't we be more like South Korea? Why did we need these draconian laws? The answer is, why isn't South Korea more like Israel? Why is Israel the startup nation? Why does Israel have a special sauce that we're leading NASDAQ and we're leading the, the, the startup, we're, we're, the, we're the Silicon Wadi? Why are we? The answer is there's a certain Israeli way. And this was um, spoken by Professor Peretz Levy, a fellow I know is the Dean of the Technion, my alma mater. And Peretz Levy said the Israeli way of casting doubts, defiance, taking risks, acting Israeli, the ability to accept failure. Because when I work with them, um, with Americans, American flight test, if it fails, then the program is doomed. We don't, if our flight test fails, then we learn from the, from the failures and we continue. That's how we are the startup nation. Now, these attributes are critical for entrepreneurship and innovation, but they're terrible for dealing with the global pandemic. Israelis have, a, you tell me to, to, to do something, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna listen to you because I know better, not because I want my liberty, like Americans feel that, that, that you can't take my liberty, you can't take away my, my, my economy in Israel. I am who I am. I know what I need to do, and, and I know better than you. The government had to say one had to say black or white, and the government said black, and that's what happened because we're Israelis, and it worked. The government knew who they were dealing with. This is my last slide. When all is said and done, Israel is um, a number of societies that are living together. And we like to say that we're one country, but you look at what's going on in B'nai Brak and. B'nai Brak had a horrible time with the, um, with the uh, pandemic because in B'nai Brak, their uh, rabbis were saying, go to shul, go to Minyan. And Minyan are out in small buildings. They live in close proximity. And the infection rates in places like B'nai Brak and in Mea Sharim, they just skyrocketed. And they had to be locked up. And not only that, but control of the city was transferred to the IDF. And the people in B'nai Brak and in Mea Sharim hate the people in the idea. They don't serve in the army. They don't believe in the state of Israel. My son-in-law was once wearing an army uniform. He went into Mea Sharim because he wanted to go on a Thursday night to buy some chulant at Shtisel, and he got stoned. And yet, they understood when the army went in, you see pictures of people in B'nai Brak coming and giving food to the armed people that are serving them. And they understand what's going on. They understand that, that something is different. Some kind of unity is needed. We're all in the same boat. They understood that we are not a group of people, that we are a nation, we are an am. And they understood that only if we understand that we are a nation, can we truly hold our heads up and say, Am Yisrael Chai. 17 minutes, Rabbi Sherman. <laughs> Machmir on time as well. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions and then um, I know we were having some technical difficulties with YouTube, but those who are watching on Facebook, if you uh, want to chime in as well, more than uh, happy to answer those questions as well. Um, I know we looked at military, we looked at religious, we looked at social, we looked at some cultural with music. I want to first start that um, this is a little different than anything that has happened, at least in my lifetime, probably in your lifetime as well. 
And it's not like there was an earthquake in LA and you asked how I'm doing here. Or there was a blizzard in New Jersey and we asked how you're doing there. Or there was, God forbid, a pigua, a terrorist attack in Israel. The fact is, in some way or form, we are all um, in this, if you wish, uh, theoretical boat together. Maybe take us back and uh, we, we mentioned Purim. Purim also here in LA was the first time, you know, people were like, maybe I'm not going to show up for a Megillah reading. Maybe we can do it online. What was the original thought of Israel? Was it, it can't happen to us? Um, and then when you realized that reality was going to set in, how quickly did that change? Was it an overnight? Was it a gradual shift? Oh, I tried to make that point. We acted more Israeli than Israeli. Um, we poo-pooed it. We um, joked about it. We um, joked about people that had gone on business trips and um, had to, well, in the middle of their business trips, the country that they went to made the blacklist and they had to come back and they had to sit in, um, in isolation for two weeks um, until the day before the shutdown, which was after Purim, I was still trying to figure out a way that I could go to Australia because mm -hmm. I had a, a business trip in Australia. And we're going to have dinner here in LA. Well, my, trip, well, my trip was canceled. My right. only flight was going through LA. Yep, I and that was one of the reasons my trip was canceled. And that's fortunate, or I would be speaking to you from Australia right now. Mm -hmm. And um, we poo pooed it. My daughter um, made uh, <laughs> shalach manas on Purim, and it was a Corona based uh, shalach manas. She gave Corona beer, and she had a picture of Batman because the coronavirus started. It was funny, it was cute. And all of a sudden, when people started getting sick and people started dying, and exponentially it went up. In a matter of days, we understood that we were um, we were not in Kansas anymore, and things went from white to black very, very quickly. And the government accelerated it. And I tried to make a point that the government needed to accelerate their their draconian measures because we, as Israelis, would have continued acting like as Israelis, and we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. I'll ask a political question a little later, but I want to go back to what you said that you've said multiple times in speaking about the Iron Dome in terms of failure and you know fail, fail again, fail better. Um, that that's how it worked. And I remember you uh, telling me many times that basically the US and other countries were not interested in something like the Iron Dome or missile defense unless it actually worked. Remember you said it's like a missile hitting a missile. You can never do that. You did it. Okay, we'll take it. Um, but as a rocket scientist, um, maybe can you explain perhaps how it's both similar or and or different from uh, looking for a cure for this? Is this like a missile hitting a missile? Is it harder? Is it easier? What is that like in terms of the scientific aspect? I, I can talk to you as a, as a person who, who knows a little about a missile hitting a missile. I can tell you that um, the hardest thing about a missile hitting a missile is doing it in battle. Because when you do it in battle, then the enemy doesn't tell you, your adversary, sorry. Your adversary doesn't tell you when he's gonna fire. He doesn't tell you what he's gonna fire. He doesn't tell you what his tactics are. And you have to, you have a tremendous amount of uncertainty and you have to be able to defend through uncertainty. One of the hardest parts of uh, facets of this pandemic has been a complete lack of certainty. People don't know what's going to be. People don't know how it's going to spread. People don't know the mechanism in which it spreads. People don't know the mechanism in which to vaccinate against it. And that is the same kind of uncertainty that, that we live in. And failure in this case is, um, is a much more difficult option than failure in a rocket attack. Um, I have a tremendous amount of, of respect for the people that are trying to go out and actually cure this disease. And I wish them a tremendous amount of luck, but I think the chances of them finding a cure for it in the near future are slim to nil. And what's more important is trying to get a handle on how we have to live until we can actually um, get rid of this disease. And there's a, there's a give and take between, between um, human life and uh, the economy. And in Israel, human life won, hands down. Our economy suffered greatly. We have no idea how we'll get back. But going back to normalcy had nothing to do with the economy, had everything to do with um, getting the number of people uh, that are, that are the, getting the number of new cases down. And what about some thoughts in terms of the news coming out with Naftali Bennett's uh, uh, sort of proclamation that Israel has something? I know you mentioned off camera, we have to be careful what we actually hear. Um, and how does that fit also into uh, two big words that are coming up nowadays, nationalism versus globalism, protecting our own versus also helping others? Because we live in such a global world now that we are, I mean, you mentioned unity. 
we are one based on getting on a plane and where we're coming from. So how does that look? Say Israel gets it, right? How do you protect yourself and also help others? Oh, so, so let, me, let me answer two questions. Two questions are disjoint. I don't um, have a tremendous amount of trust of, um, of politicians, especially when these politicians are, um, are trying to finagle their way into a unity government. So if it were anyone other than um, Naftali Bennett, I would be very doubtful of what he's saying. Um, at this point in time, I, I choose to, um, I choose, I, I would like to be um, shown otherwise, but I, I have, I'm, I'm extremely doubtful of, of what, it, that said, I know that there's a tremendous amount of, um, of research is going on, especially in Israel in a number of places. Um, there's a place in Kiryat Shmona that had been doing research on very similar virus on, um, on uh, fowl. And the question was, how can we transfer what we have learned so, that's, um, so that it can be used on humans? Uh, in your other question, um, we, we, we don't know anything about, about just Israel. If Israel ever finds a virus, then just like we open source the, um, the uh, uh, ventilators, that wasn't open source only on Israeli internet, that was open source around the world. We didn't care, we do the same thing to the virus. Um, if people don't understand how important life is to people living in Israel, then they should understand after this. Mm -hmm. And I want to take it back to the Jewish aspect. Um, I know we mentioned Purim as sort of that date and time um, here as well. That's when, you know, uh, Jewish day schools, at least in LA, began thinking about maybe we have to change our um, way that we're going to educate. And we thought, you know what, we'll be back by the Seder. And then it came to Seder, and then we went through that whole piece. Now we're looking toward Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Um, what do you think that looks like in terms of the Israeli community? And uh, also maybe if you can distinguish between, in this case, religious and secular, um, minyanim versus cultural aspects and things like that. Um, what, are we, what are we looking at in a couple of months for high holidays? It, it, it's interesting when, when, you, when you look at what um, Tova just showed me, what my wife just showed me, a very, very interesting article by, uh, that was written by, uh, by a woman who was professed um, not religious. And she lived in an apartment building and beneath her was a, um, a porch minion, similar to the minion that we had in our yeshuv, uh, people that were on the porches and they were davening. And, and she said that it, it changed the way she looked at life. She knew that the day began when they daven shachri. She knew that the day ended when they uh, daven marv. She knew that when Shabbos came in, they daven slower and they sang more. And it, it, it gave her a certain kind of structure and it gave her a certain kind of envy that these people were doing something together and she's stuck alone in her apartment. Um, I believe that the, the more um, of an of a, um, affinity you have to Judaism, the more affinity you have to community. And um, I think the religious had an easier time, if only because we were together three times a day. Mm -hmm. And there was very little talk going on because we were far. I mean, I was you know, five meters, 10 meters from the closest person. It doesn't lend itself to conversation. We were together and it was very, very important. Um, Israel is moving faster than the US. According to the, um, according to the most pessimistic, of uh, predictions, we'll be up uh, full speed, pretty much full speed by June the 30th. So, pretty so what much do you mean by full speed? Full speed, which means that the, all of the laws, the, um, all of the isolation laws will be um, rescinded by June the 30th. There will be laws that have to do, that, that, that will um, keep the border shut, but within Israel, the, the hotels will have been open, you'll have sporting events. This is all under the assumption that as the laws are gradually <laughs> rescinded, there won't be a spike in new corona cases. But if we have actually succeeded in defeating for now the virus, and we're done by June the 30th, we're way ahead of you guys. So, um, and it was very, very painful, but um, we're coming out of it. And let's so, look in terms of the uh idea of the globalism, but also protecting from Israel's enemies. Um, I mentioned to you off camera before, you know, in the front page of the news, you don't hear about um, Iran anymore. You don't hear about terrorist attacks and things like that. Are they not happening? Or is it because that we have other things to worry about on our own shores? Uh, there, if you read the newspaper, you go, you go past the first couple of pages, which are always dedicated to coronavirus. Things are happening. Last week, there was a terrorist attack in Kfar Saba. The, um, there was a fellow who brandished a knife. He, um, he knifed someone. Uh, the terrorist was um, neutralized, and um, there have been um, un there have been attacks in Syria recently. Um, no one's taking responsibility for those attacks. I can't believe that the the, the Latvians are responsible. 
Um, <laughs> these, so these have pretty much been banished. The, the, Iran has had a terrible time, horrific time. Most of the, um, the Arab countries have not had such a difficult time with coronavirus. Um, Iran is a, um, an exception. They've had a horrific time. To the point now that I'm reading in the news that Iran is um, beginning to pull out of Syria um, because they can't remain in Syria because things are breaking down in Iran. And if that's the case, then um, maybe that's the reason why we had coronavirus because that was probably the most existential threat to Israel was not Iran's uh, nuclear weapon. The most immediate existential threat to Israel was um, the massing of uh, Iranian troops in Syria. And if that I mean, is, um, as we understand, they're heading back to Iran, then we should say hello. No, uh, last time I saw you in person was actually in Haifa, where you briefed uh, my trip with the APAC rabbinical students. And it was just a couple of days after, uh, um, I'm blanking on his name, Sul Suleimanian? Yep. Yep, uh, was taken out. And uh, the question was, you know, was Israel going to be attacked? And you don't hear anything, actually, you hear the opposite. Is <laughs> Will Israel heal the world? So much that uh, I believe, you know, Arab governments had said, if Israel comes up with the cure, it's okay. Yeah, it's they okay. came up with a fatwa. Please, there was a fatwa that came out from um, from people in country, I think in Syria even, that if they, in, no, in Iran, in Iran, if the Israelis come out with a cure, then we will be make ill and we will take it. We'll, we'll do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, what does it look like on the missile defense industry right now? Is that, has that slowed down because of what everything, is it ramping up? What it just in terms of sort of off topic, but perhaps it maybe is related. What does that look like now um, in exactly. Israel and globally? I can tell you that um, Israel is um, defending itself. Israel will continue to defend itself. Um, when there are shortages of money, there are certain um, areas that don't suffer. And um, defense of Israel is one of those areas. Uh, perhaps the, the, the future budget of um, the Israeli military has to be reshuffled, but um, not a hair on anybody's head will be, um, will be um, impinged upon because of this uh, coronavirus. And in terms of the army, I know you mentioned, uh, was it your son-in-law, right? He's, son. he's your son, sorry, um, right? Usually soldiers are coming home every couple of weeks for Shabbat. What did that look like in real time? We don't necessarily think about that. Most of our children are not in the military here. What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, in the words of Lubavitch Rebbe, and I quote, it sucked. Um, he would typically come, he's in, in officer's uh, training. He's there for, uh, for five months. Typically he comes home every, um, every two weeks, worst case, every three weeks. He was there for 45 days. We didn't see him for 45 days. Really, really cool. We wanted to be able to, to have some kind of contact with him. And um, we knew that he was going on maneuvers in the north of the country. He was not allowed to meet us. Had he met us, he would have been thrown out of uh, the, the course. But he sent me the coordinates of a place in which I could leave him a um, can of cookies and a book that he wanted. And I did. And I went into this Arab town and I went to those coordinates and he sent me a picture from Google Earth and I dropped it off. He picked it up a couple of days later and it really changed his, um, changed his week. It's, um, and and it, that's, that was the closest we could get to our son. And that was about four weeks ago. So um, yeah, everybody's suffering. And uh, he, he lives in his own bubble. The, um, the army is its own bubble. The army cannot afford to have coronavirus outbreak. So, the so you, mentioned, yeah, you, you mentioned bubbles, um, and you also mentioned uh, earlier about uh, Corona minions in hotels. What did that look like, and how was that able to happen? At one time, the only minions that were going on were um, Corona minions in the hotel, and there were pictures of them floating around. <laughs> if you wanted to dive in with a minion, then you had to get coronavirus so that you'd go to a hotel. Um, they were holding us up for a while. I believe that, that if there's no minion in the world, then... Um, well, that's a bad thing. God's going to start scratching his head. I don't think that God would ever, would ever um, do something that would completely eradicate minions around the world. And that was the, that was the vestige. Oh, and uh, yeah, I mean, to see the pictures of the Kotel Plaza empty really were almost mind boggling. Um, to... On the other hand, I just saw a picture yeah. tonight. They've upped it to 300. 300 people where you can dive in with up to 19 people. People say, why 19? Why not 37? 19, because if you get an extra person, you break into too many. Right. So um, the coattails, we're, 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 we're ramping up slowly. We got our foot very, very close to the break, just in case. But um, the draconian measures, measures that you would never have thought would have been taken in the state of Israel by Jewish people, uh -huh. were taken to save the lives of, of, of... We did this 
to protect the people who were most at risk. And these were the people that were above the age of 60, 65. Mm -hmm. And we sacrificed for them um, at the beginning, unwillingly, because the government had to slam it down. But then you saw acts of chesed, people going out and purchasing for older people, people buying stuff, people coming to visit, people calling, because that's what we were doing it for. And if you didn't ram it through your head, that's what you're doing it for. You're going to start asking yourself, what are you doing it for? Mm -hmm. And there was a tremendous amount of chesed. And that just goes along with the, the idea of, of an am, the idea of a nation. Um, so we do have we do have a question from online. Um, you mentioned the fatwa. Um, is Israel taking advantage of the opportunity with that fatwa to uh, pursue diplomatic relations more aggressively at this time? Interesting. Um, I, I'm not in a position to um, to say yay or nay. Um, I, I would be surprised if um, if if, uh, if we were doing so. What I read about in the news is um, is attacks in Syria. And um, and uh, aggressive. Not exactly from, diplomatic. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think diplomacy is um, is is too much in vogue right now. Um, but what about like you know, for instance, uh, an organization like Israel that goes outside of its borders? That's their mission. That Israel goes outside of its borders to help others. I know I saw earlier that you know Israel was trying to get their um, their citizens home. Um, has there been any stories of Israel going outside their borders to help? No, sir. Uh, in fact, the, the stories of getting Israelis home are astounding. You had um, a, an El Al jet flew from the first for the first time nonstop from Tel Aviv to Melbourne. It was there for three hours. It picked up a bunch of people and it came home. It's like I'm I got to drive to Jerusalem to pick up my friend and drive. It's two hours. Yeah, fine, but I like my friend. I'm going to bring him home. I got to fly 17 hours to Melbourne to pick up a bunch of Israelis who are out there in in Australia. They want to come home, and I'm bringing them home. I'm going to spend three hours in Melbourne, change my clothes. The same crew came back. They had wow. two crews went back and forth. Going outside the borders of Israel was impossible. We are shut down. Israel, as a member of the world community at this point in time, we're connected by um, virtually only. Actually, that's interesting that you say that. Um, so that's Israel to the world. How about how do you feel Jewishly to the world, actually, with Israel uh, being the epicenter of where we dive in, where we focus our, our attention? Jews are connected around the world, um, not only virtually, we're connected spiritually, and that hasn't changed at all. Um, I, I believe that our connection has only been strengthened. People um, davening here for the Jews in the United States of America, just like the Jews in the United States of America, daven for Israelis when, uh, when a missile, when a rocket falls in Sederot. Now the shoe is on the other foot, and it's, it's, our, it's our honor and it's our duty. Daven for the Jews in America to try to be here for them, do whatever it is that we can. And just only to say, hey, we're here and we're davening and we're continuing. That's that's about sometimes the only thing we can do. And uh, politically, obviously, we have an election coming up here. I'm not going to go into that in terms of perhaps how that <laughs> student council president here. Um, but uh, what does that look like in terms of Israel? You mentioned unity. You mentioned perhaps unity government. You mentioned, uh, is there a fourth election coming up? Um, you know, seeing uh, Gantz and BB try to come together. How has that played out through all of the, all of this? Um, the only reason that we have uh, that we that we have a unity government, uh, unless um, the the Supreme Court rules otherwise, is because the most pressing issue ceased to be personal and it became um, coronavirus. And had it not been for coronavirus, my guess is that we would have had a fourth election. I don't know. I'm not a prophet, but. Um, it's, it's patently obvious that this, that people had to stand up and put the issue of, of um, leading Israel through this morass above their own personal, um, their personal good. I don't know if, if that would be replicated anywhere else around the world, um, for instance, the United States of America. But if that did happen, boy, that would be amazing. And uh, I know it's been uh, heart-wrenching, at least for a lot of families here at Sinai Temple. The summer is a time to travel to Israel, um, whether it's for birthdays, b'nai mitzvah, weddings, etc. cetera. Um, I know those plans have all, of course, uh, basically evaporated. Um, I myself was supposed to take a trip uh, next summer. We'll see if that happens. Um, how, do we, how do we move on from here when uh, Israel is such part of our lives um, that we literally are separated? I know you mentioned the spiritual. Um, but what can we do to, it's interesting, right? As you said, you're, you're helping us now. Is there anything that we can do to um, strengthen our own connection by helping you? 
I mean, the, the, the obvious, um, the, 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 you have physical connection and spiritual connection. So if your physical connection is diminished, then you have to make up for it with spiritual connection. But not only spirit, um, uh, it's, it's very, very important that, um, that Sinai Temple continue doing what they're doing um, with, with pro-Israel advocacy, APAC, and that sort of stuff. Very, very important that you can do from within the United States of America. Um, we'll be here and um, waiting for you guys to come join us. And I just want to go back to the uh, minion, actually, in your backyard. Uh, what happens for Torah readings? Is there a Torah in your yard or how, do, how does that work? No Torah. No Torah. no Torah reading. One of the hardest parts was um, davening without a uh, Sefer Torah. And for a number of weeks, we didn't have a Sefer Torah. Um, there were a number of minyanim that were illegal, people that were leaving their homes to daven in the streets, which was illegal, and we would not do it. And because they were doing it illegally, they would skip parts of davening. We did all the davening that we could do. Mm -hmm. The things that we couldn't do because we didn't have a Sefer Torah, we, we, we didn't do. So we felt that we were obeying the laws of God Almighty. And we were obeying the laws of the Ministry of, uh, of Health. Mm -hmm. Recently, over the last two weeks, as they've slowly begun rescinding these laws, then the street minions have become uh, more and more prevalent, and they have Sifrei Torah. So Did street, street minions? Pardon me? Street, street minions? minions yeah, street minions. 19, up to 19 people. Um, minimum of two meters between people. Two meters in, in, uh, for Americans, like 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. Um, no, just kidding. It's 16. And, um, and um, we keep way more than two meters. I'll tell you something, after, after spending six weeks at home, I sort of clench when someone else comes into my space. You uh -huh. will find that when you start going out, you have this visceral, whoa, stand back sort of thing. And Armagnon, we don't stay two meters away. We, sp we stay um, closer to five meters away. And I read the Torah. One of the things I do is I, I, I know how to read the Torah and, and I won't read the Torah because I don't want to be in the vicinity of other people who I don't know. And if, perhaps I'm wrong, but it's this visceral stay away from me. You guys will start feeling it when you start leaving home. So what happened with like uh, things that theoretically cannot be postponed, like B'nai Mitzvah, what are, what are happening with that? B'nai Mitzvah can be postponed. Right, you so they're- You surprised what, what can be postponed. Weddings um, are not being postponed. Um, you have what, does that, what does that look like on the ground? What does it look like? Um, well, until recently, <laughs> it looked like only immediate family can show up, the Hus and the Kala and their parents. In our Yishuv, we had a, we had a wedding, and the wedding was supposed to be uh, in, a, in a large hall, hundreds of people. They had the wedding in someone's backyard. Mm -hmm. About uh, 10, 15 people were there. And what they did was they took the Hus and the Kala, they put them in the back of a pickup truck, and mm -hmm. then they paraded them around the Yishuv. And as the parade passed everyone's house, people would come out and clap. And wow. it was a sight to be seen. Um, wow. Recently, they went up to 19 people at a wedding. And starting on Sunday, there will be up to 50 people at a wedding, which is good because my brother-in-law is marrying off a daughter. Oh, and wow. 50 people already that you can begin to have much of the immediate family there. Right. Um, but you would be surprised what people can do um, during, uh, during this. No, I think it's tested our uh, will, but I think it's also um, allowed us to imagine our creativity. Um, you know, people are asking, what do we compare this to? And God forbid we compare it to the Shoah in terms of that aspect. Um, but also people ask, you know, in terms of the destruction of the, of the temple, in terms of recreating the Jewish aspect, is there a type of comparison that you have or is this just so new that we don't know what it's like until uh, 2020 vision? <laughs> the 2020 vision uh, in, in, in looking back at 2020. Um, <laughs> it, to me, it reminded me of, um, of 1991 and 2006. And 1991 was, um, we spent six months going in and out of um, our sealed rooms because um, mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein was mm -hmm. regularly firing uh, Scud B missiles at us, claiming that he was going to uh, put weapons of mass destruction in it. Summer 2006, we had something similar. And it was amazing how fast we came out of it. We had a certain new uh, modus vivendi, and then bang, that modus vivendi changed one day. Uh -huh. And then we slipped back into the old way of doing things. And that's where Hanan ben Ari comes. I don't want to slip back into the old way of doing things. I want to learn something. I want to change. And do you think that's going to happen? Is that true? No. <laughs> so when do I we want that to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. So when do we? When are we able to change that mindset to uh, to slip back? Before it happens. 
before it happens. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting you mentioned 1991 in terms of the Gulf War um, and 2006. Um, you know, we don't have those experiences. In fact, those are the times that we say, you know what, we'll delay our trip to Israel, right? We'll go next year. And now when, as I said in the beginning, we have those, if you wish, similar experiences, but uh, different reactions to that, um, then are the conclusions similar or different is also an interesting question as well. Um, I know we're all struggling for that. As I mentioned, you know, the hot topic in the Jewish news over here is the high holidays, especially as people are often connected to synagogues through that. The question is why? Why do I have to do it if I can, you know, watch it on the screen? I think you mentioned uh, importantly that the spiritual is as important um, as the physical uh, um, right now. Um, today is uh, the, you mentioned Yom Um what, what, what do people look forward to now? <laughs> you know, we sort of went from Pesach, Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron, Yom What's the next, what's the next goal? Is it just going to the mall? Next goal is, um, my next goal is to be able to celebrate Shavuos the way Shavuos is meant to be celebrated. And to elaborate on that. Goal. I want to, I want to, um, I want to go to Shiurim at night. I want to give a Shir at night. I want to be with other people. I want to eat my cheesecake. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to go back to something that you said, if, if I may. Yeah. 9 11, uh, America changed. And America was attacked. And there was a tremendous outpouring of, of, um, of a feeling of how important it was to be American and how important American value is. You there? Sorry, just having some technical difficulties. Give us uh, 20 years later. And all I can oh, sorry, you froze. Can you just go back there for a second? Yeah, I'm saying that that everybody felt an, a certain this certain inimitable feeling after 9/11, and you read about it, and you spoke to Americans. Now we we don't call them French fries, call them Freedom Fries, and, yeah. and we're Americans, and we'll get through this, and and God bless America. And 20 years later, as far as I can see, all we got left of it is waiting an extra 10 to 15 minutes in line with a bunch of TSA guys check us out before we get on an airplane. I don't want that to happen in Israel. This was our 9-11. This is the world's 9-11. And I don't want to look back 20 years from now. And all that I have remaining from this is that in a meeting, I have to stay two meters away from the person standing next to me. It's got to be more than that. Mm -hmm. Again, we want to thank um, Ari, Ari Satcher, a, uh, again, uh, not just a friend, but also a extended family member um, for joining us from Israel. Um, again, comparing what he does as a scientist, but really also as a Torah scholar as well. Um, he writes a beautiful weekly column. If you, uh, if people can sign up by sending you an email, is that correct? Let's get it on um, Times of Israel. Times of Israel, exactly. A beautiful uh, weekly column. We speak about the spiritual, um, but also truly uh, saving lives in Israel, but also beyond protecting the state of Israel, the land of Israel for the Jewish people and all of us as well. Um, I like to call him a true, uh, not just Jewish hero, but uh, not an Israeli hero, but a uh, hero of humanity. So we look forward awesome. to seeing you in person. Again, we want to thank the Sinai Temple Israel Center for sponsoring um, today. Um, it's on Facebook and God willing will also be on YouTube later for review. So please share with your family and friends. And uh, we look forward to um, many more um, days of Simcha and most importantly of Shalom of peace uh, in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Amen. So thank you everybody. And uh, thank you, Ari. Cheers. Good night. Yeah, bye-bye.